Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for attending today's presentation, uh, which marks the start of McEwen Celebrates Month of Scholarship. Uh, my name is Karen Keeler. I'm the Dean of the Library and uh, moderator for this presentation. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people. We honour and respect the history, languages, ceremonies, and culture of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who call this territory home. The First People's connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. With this acknowledgement, we honour the ancestors and children who have been buried, her, uh, buried here, missing and murdered Indigenous women and men, and the process of ongoing collective healing for all human beings. We are reminded that we are all treaty people and of the responsibility we have to one another. Today, we are joined by Vala McLean for her presentation, Beginnings, a story of Grant McEwen Community College. Vala is the university archivist, classics, history, languages, and philosophy librarian. She is also a sessional faculty member teaching courses in archives and records management in the library and information technology diploma program here at, at McEwen. And since we're talking about history this afternoon, I'll mention that Vala has been at McEwen for 15 years. So welcome Vala, you've got the floor. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So this is Beginnings, a story of Grant McEwen Community College. I will use the discoveries I made while working on the Grant McEwen Community College Oral History Project from 2017 to 2020, materials from the University Archives and the book published by Glenn David Rule in 1995 called Grant McEwen Community College, The First Two Decades, to provide a history of Grant McEwen Community College. In doing so though, I do not proclaim this to be a comprehensive history, more of a small slice of history. 25 individuals chose to participate, nine alumni, six who became McEwen employees, six instructors, and 10 administrators. So why an oral history of Grant McEwen Community College? The Oral History Association defines oral history as a field of study and a method of gathering, preserving, and interpreting the voices and memories of people, communities, and participants in past events. Oral history is both the oldest type of historical inquiry, predating the written word and one of the most modern, initiated with tape recorders in the 1940s and now using 21st century digital technologies. I chose oral history because they provide an invaluable opportunity to learn about historical events from those present in their own words. They offer rich evidence about the subjective or personal meaning of events. I also felt that then Glenn David Rule's book on the first two decades of the community college was comprehensive and I had no desire to write another book as I find writing for public consumption to be downright painful. So the purpose of the Grant McEwen Community College Oral History Project was to document the institution's history through the careers and lives of alumni, faculty and staff involved in or directly affected by the activities and events during this time, 1971 to 1999. The interviewees testimonies, I would hope, would fill gaps in the historical record and provide a more complete picture of McEwen University's history when used with other archival records. In late 2017, a call for participants went out in retirees um, McEwen newsletter, Romu, and Alumni News. I was looking for people who had firsthand knowledge, were enthusiastic about participating, were comfortable with being recorded, represented as many roles as possible, alumni, faculty, and staff, and were ideally from various decades, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. For the first phase of the project, I wanted to interview 10 to 15 alumni or faculty and staff who attended Grant McEwen Community College from 71 to 99. This number was based on oral history literature 
which indicates preparing for, conducting, and fully processing oral history interviews can be quite time consuming. At least one source suggested up to 30 hours for each interview. Each interviewee was asked about 10 questions based on their role, whether they were an instructor, staff, or student, or both student and staff. The questions were aimed to understand why people came to the college. What did they do here? What did they study while they were at the community college? What events do they remember? Who do they remember? Basically, what, it was, what was it like to work at or go to school at Grant McEwen Community College? Before I discuss some of the themes that came out of the interviews, I wanna take a step back and answer the question of why a community college? And why is the institution named after Dr. McEwen? Because it has implications for who chooses to work at or attend the community college and the development of organizational culture or spirit of the institution. Students attended classes at Grant McEwen Community College for the first time on September 7th, 1971. However, Glenn David Rule argues the story of community college begins with the Alberta government passing the University Acts of 1906 and 1910. In 1910, the act called um, the University of Alberta, but referred to as the University Act, states that any institution or college in the province must have an affiliation with the University of Alberta for the promotion of any other useful branch of learning. So this act and the one in 1906 would, according to rule, form the basis of government policy towards colleges. It also establishes the dominant role of the University of Alberta in the province. Uh, if we think about it, Alberta becomes a province in 1905. The first University Act is passed in 1906 and 1910. U of A opens up in 1908, and they're the sole provider of post-secondary university level education in Alberta until the 1960s. By the late 1950s into the 1960s, um, Rule talks about how there was increased funding support for technical education rapid urbanization, and the recognition of the relationship between workforce training and economic growth. These things exert pressure to establish a more extensive post-secondary educational system in Alberta. So this leads to the establishment of public colleges, Lethbridge in 57, Red Deer in 1964, Medicine Hat, Grand Prairie in Calgary in 1966, and a push to create a college in Edmonton. In 1968, the Edmonton Public School Board and the separate school board put together a proposal. In their proposal, according to uh, Rule, Nate and the University of Alberta are not really meeting the needs of all the graduating students in Edmonton. So in April of 1969, the college, um, the Edmonton College Planning Committee is established and it submits a report to the post-secondary board known as the Edmonton College Report. So this, out of this report comes uh, an immediate need for a two-year college in Edmonton, whose primary function should be programs and courses that complement the University of Alberta and Nate. Major program offers, offerings of the college were seen by the committee to be related to career development, particularly in the services sector, remedial education programs, and general post-secondary and continuing education. So in 1969, we get the College Act, which establishes the Alberta Colleges Commission. And their primary function is to act as an intermediary between the government and the province's public colleges. So out of this comes a recommendation to the minister, um, essentially establishing the need for what is known at the time as the Edmonton College. On May 4th, 19, sorry, yes. So on May 4th, 1970, the Minister of Education, R.C. Clark, recommends to the Lieutenant Governor, Grant McEwen, that the public college be established in Edmonton. So the Alberta Colleges Commission puts a call out for board members. And at a July 8th, 1970 board meeting of the Edmonton College, the name of the college is discussed. Two possible names were considered. Community College of Edmonton and Edmonton Community College. Members of the board, Barry Moore, Edward Stack, Winifred Ferguson, Fred Crulo, and Robert Gruber 
feel that an effort should be made to research the provinces and or Edmonton's history in the hope that a suitable name could be selected. So how does the community college come to be named after Grant McEwen? At the July 15th, 1970 board meeting, Edward Stack suggests that naming the college after an individual would be a worthwhile way to proceed. Two names were submitted, John Michaels and John Walter Grant McEwen. Dr. J.W. Grant McEwen um, came out as the, the name to be selected primarily because of his availability to lay the cornerstone and participate in the opening of the college. So who were John Michaels and John Walter Grant McEwen? The decision at the July 15th, 1970 board meeting to name the community college after Grant McEwen was based on the assumption he could be involved with the college. And when I read that, I thought, well, that sounds really, that doesn't sound like they had much of a debate. They just decided on Grant McEwen because he could be around. Until I realized and did a bit of research to realize that John Michaels died in 1962. So he isn't alive in 1970 when discussions about the naming of the college are held. So this is a picture of um, the Rotarians they were called and John Michaels, I have him singled out there. So they're um, singing a little song supporting the grads as they go off to Europe to compete in the European championship in 1924 Olympics. John Michaels was a really popular and well-known Edmontonian. According to a January 11, 1962 article in the Edmonton Journal, John Michaels came to Edmonton in 1912 from New York City. He started selling papers there at the age of 10 and continued doing so when he came to Edmonton. He opened up a newspaper stand on Jasper Avenue and 101 Street called Mike's Newsstand. Mr. Michaels was a great booster of Edmonton in the North. He assisted in creating and financing the first mail carrying airline from Edmonton to the Northwest Territories. For having supplied reading material to Canadian and US Army personnel stationed in the North during the Second World War, he received the Medal of Freedom in 1946, the highest US award to civilians. So it's interesting to consider if John Michaels had been alive in 1970, we could be working at John Michaels University instead of McEwen University. Or if the board had decided against the name of an individual, we could be working at the University of Edmonton or Edmonton University. So who was John Walter Grant McEwen? I'm going to speak briefly about him because he's gonna come up again when I discuss the themes that came out of the oral history project. So by 1970, um, I mean, he was the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta from 66 to 74. He'd written numerous books. He was a former member of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta from 55 to 59, leader of the Liberal Party in Alberta from 58 to 60, mayor of Calgary from 63 to 65, a former professor of the University of Saskatchewan, dean of agriculture at the University of Manitoba. The most dominant theme that came out of the interviews was an absolute admiration for Dr. McEwen. It's important to note that Dr. McEwen didn't just lend his name to the community college. He was keen to visit, participate in events, be involved with the community college and its people. He's 91 years old when the city center campus opens in 1993. By that time, he has difficulty walking around, but he's still here for those opening ceremonies. In interviews with students, instructors, and administrators, everyone had a great deal of affection for Dr. McEwen. He was frugal, down to earth, made you feel important, loved coming to the college, it was a man with solid values. He was engaging and a powerful public speaker. Jill Day, a student in the library technician program from 1984 to 1986, said Grant McEwen was the kind of man when you asked a question, he looked you in the eye and he listened to your answer. You maybe only talked to him for 30 to 60 seconds, but you felt like you were important for that 30 to 60 seconds. Sherry Ann Hoffmeyer, a nursing instructor from 72 to 1997, said Grant McEwen was really down to earth. You could relate to him. He was just that kind of person that made you feel important. I think that that permeated the culture in terms of the students and that then students were important to us. He treated everybody equally. Sharon Schnell, who had a long career at McEwen from 71 to 2009 and held secretarial positions and administrative positions in the School of Business, 
So McEwen was a very generous man, generous because for his stature in society, he had an appreciation for human beings, a rare, rare human being. First person I ever knew that wrote a creed for himself. Yes, very inspiration. Character, 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 said Chuck Day, vice president academic in 1971, wouldn't take a plane. When every time we brought him up to Calgary, he had to come on bus, wouldn't take a taxi, always stayed at the YMCA. Once when I picked him up to take him to the Mad Hatter's Ball, he said, come a little early. I wanna go over to the library. Fine, sure, I'll do that. So I thought, well, we'll take him to the library. He'll come out of the library. We'll take him back and he'll get his tuxedo on and we'll go to the ball. I picked him up and we could uh, took him over to the library. And he says, I won't be long. I said, don't worry, Grant, I've got lots of time. About half an hour later, he comes out all dressed in his tuxedo out of the library. So he must have changed in the washroom. So there he was. I don't know what the people in the library thought. I picked him up and off we went to the ball. So these are just a few excerpts from the interviews. There are many, many more examples like this. But it leads me to the question, what impact did Dr. McEwen have on the community college? And I think that all he had accomplished by the time the college is named after him, his character, how he inspires staff and students to embrace his values. I think two good examples are the establishment of McEwen Day and the McEwen Medallion. In 1984, Jerry Kelly, the president at the time, recommends to the board that a day in February be declared Grant McEwen Day in honor of Dr. McEwen. Although I was unable to find a reason why the month of February was chosen, I assume it's because the community college's official opening was in February of 1972. When I interviewed Jerry Kelly, he had this to say about Dr. McEwen. It's always upbeat, loved to visit his college, McEwen portrayed a humble but genuine and fun-loving fun aura about him. I always felt it was grace to be in the presence of a truly remarkable human being. I put into place in the early 1980s, the Grant McEwen Day, to honor our beloved namesake. Each McEwen Day was highlighted by one of his impromptu but impassioned speeches, usually dealing with the environment. So Grant McEwen Day was a day when all staff would come together. Dr. McEwen came to the college, he toured the campuses, there'd be breakfast, entertainment, often students from the music program, there'd be chili cook-offs, brown bag lunches, and of course that speech. One of the interviewees said that one of the big deals about the McEwen Day was collecting those themed sweatshirts. He paid 20 bucks, nobody minded. It was always designed, often by the Students Association working with community relations. You would get your McEwen Day sweatshirt and it could be casual or Western. In 1986, the McEwen Medallion is established. It is the highest form of recognition given to an employee. Named after Dr. McEwen, the college's namesake, it embodies the true spirit of the man. A nomination formed from the late 1980s states the candidates should exhibit qualities of energy, integrity, and excellence, and whose initiative and dedication exemplifies a strong commitment to the college and the community. Many of the interviewees for Grant McEwen Community College Oral History Project were awarded the McEwen Medallion, and for some, it was the proudest achievements of their career. Sharon Schnell, of course, the highest honor for me was receiving the McEwen Medallion in 1982. Terry Flanagan, who helped to establish the Grant McEwen Community College Foundation in 19, 1979, to the question, what are the proudest achievements during your career at McEwen? Oh, McEwen Medallion would be the biggest one, presented by Grant McEwen in 1989. Rick Lewis, a biology instructor who was awarded the McEwen Medallion in 2008, said we were dedicated to serving the needs of the community, not just in terms of what we offered, but in terms of participating volunteering for things in the community. The essence of the McEwen Medallion is not just what you do at McEwen because that's your job. You shouldn't receive it just for what you do here. That was a real honor to feel like I was contributing not just to McEwen, but outside McEwen. I noticed the second theme. Um, this is what I'm sort of, sort of referring to as all hands on deck. The sense that everyone was working hard to achieve a goal. Indeed, um, Glenn David Rule writes in his book on the early years of the community college, the idealistic goals of the new college's novelty were supplemented by the energy and dedication of its new employees. 
Its essence, the human element, was and remains the central ingredient for the success of Grant McEwen Community College. So when I asked the interviewees about what do they remember about campus life when they started, Chuck Day, Vice President of Academic in 1971, said inclusive. Yes, everything we did involved everybody. It didn't matter who you were, what you did, what your job was, you were welcome. Yes, so that's what I remember most, I think, in highly spirited. Everybody, I think, had a, a little bit, a sense of adventure in them. What are we doing? This is new. Yes, so that's what I remember about it. Jerry Nakanachi, a nursing instructor and Dean of Health and Community Studies from 73 to 2005, said, besides the interdisciplinary collaboration, it was just a very friendly, supportive environment. And you know, everybody seemed to be willing to support one another. I guess it's because those were the early years when we were starting up growing. And so there was a sense of family about it, which was great. Sharon Schnell said, I think it's a rare opportunity to be part of a new institution. And I'm very thankful that I was there for that time. It's different than coming into an institution that's established. Yes, that's exciting and you come onto a new job and you grow, but to be part of a post-secondary institution from its beginning was very exhilarating for me. We were the new kids on the block. We had to prove ourselves and which everybody helped to do. The evolution from community college to college was phenomenal. If you think about it, we went from just 40 years. Everybody was interested in moving forward. The other thing that I appreciate now since I retired and that there was a climate for individuals to collectively debate. Some might say complain, but debate, debate issues in the institution. I think that was healthy. And from those debates, I learned so much. Another theme that comes across uh, that I found from reading the um, interviews is the blurring of the lines between community and the college and the college and the community. So instructors were drawn from uh, industry, professional agencies, as well as secondary and post-secondary educational institutions. So if there was a really strong candidate for instructional position, they might not require a degree if they were considered to be an authority in their field. Paul Ansel, an instructor in the travel program starting in 1976, said the community college was offering some courses in travel training, travel agency training, and an approach was made to probably half a dozen of us in the business community whether we would be interested in participating and help develop a program that trains travel agents, travel consultants for our industry, which was having trouble getting properly trained people at the time. Brenda Hoffernan, who taught in the therapist program, was also from industry. She was an education therapist assistant, had never taught before, but thought she would apply. So the community was brought in to teach and develop programs for the college. But the point in the early days of the college was to inhabit buildings in the community. So the image before you now is the locations of um, the various uh, colleges and their locations in uh, the early 70s. Bruce Vincent, Director of Facilities and Planning from 1974 to 2000, remembers the community college's philosophy. He said that the college was going to go out into the community. That's why it was a community college. And that's why spaces were rented, renovated away from any central campus. When I spoke to Jerry Kelly, the college's second president, and Bruce Vincent, they both talked about how space, finding locations, renovating locations was a constant job. So let's take a look at some of those earlier campuses, the locations in the community and the programming. The college officially opens its doors on September 7th, 1971, with an enrollment of 410 students. John R. Hell's president's message in the preliminary announcement for the college, he says, a need was felt in the community for a broader educational base and a new kind of educational thinking combining general education and sub-professional skills. The programs which have been established were designed to meet the challenge of change in the 70s and will reflect such areas of change as occupational outlook, environment, urban and rural patterns of living, and educate and the realization that education is a lifelong process. So at the time, students can attend one of two campuses, the one before you, Old Scona campus at 105 2384 Avenue, 84 Avenue in the south side. 
This building houses classes for the academic division, general arts and science, urban studies, and college prep courses. And the applied sciences division, behavioral sciences technician, biomedical technician, and nursing. The second campus was a former Dominion grocery store at 8020 118th Avenue on the north side of the city known as Cromdale campus. It housed the applied science division. So that was social services technician, law enforcement, library technician, fashion sales technician, instructional assistant, journalism, advertising, public relations, and audiovisual technician. It also housed the business division, legal secretary, medical secretary, executive secretary, scientific technician secretary, accounting, law clerk, uh, law clerk, marketing, and public administration. Because of the rapid increase in student enrollments during the first year of operations, premises were acquired to establish the third campus located on the north side and named the Assumption Campus at 10766 97th Street. As a result of this additional space, both the academic division and the division of business uh, administration were moved to this new campus. In 1973, the Jasper Place campus opens at 1045 156th Street, Millwoods at 76 at 7319 29th Avenue. The Jasper Place campus gets uh, demolished and rebuilt in 1980. We have the 7th Street Plaza at campus in 1986 at 10030 107th Street. And then you should all recognize this campus, City Center, in 1993. Cromdale, Assumption, 7th Street Plaza. These campuses stand out in the minds of the interviewees, perhaps because they were leased spaces that were renovated to accommodate the community college. When Jill Day was a student at Cromdale in the library technician program in the 1980s, she said, you knew everybody. You knew the students, you knew the facility staff, you knew the receptionist, you knew everybody. You'd go to the cafeteria, you knew everybody. You'd go into the kitchen and make your own toast. It was very much a community relationship. It was wonderful. I mean, you participated in everything because it was right there. Michelle Besner, a student in the library technician program and employed in the library in, at McEwen in the early 80s, said Cromdale was a very special place. You really got to know everybody really well. You got to know the students, you got to know the staff, the faculty. I remember that there were two ladies that worked in the cafeteria. This was long before Aramark or any of that. And I just loved them both. Sometimes they would go and sit and have coffee, and I would go and make myself a sandwich. Everybody got to know each other. You'd go into the ladies' washroom and you'd say, hey, Mary, by the way, you have an overdue book. It was a totally different atmosphere. So I loved Cromdale. Sharon Schnell, who worked at the Assumption Campus, said it was interesting because the main section where the classes were, that's where the classes were, but the attachment for faculty office was formerly a hotel. So each office had its own little sink and a little cloakroom. It just made it really interesting. In the process of developing the University Archives in 2013, I came into contact with many people who had worked at McEwen when it was a community college. And without fail, people would speak about that period with such fondness. There was a warmth in their voice. So I wasn't surprised when one of the themes that came out of the interviews was one of camaraderie or fellowship. Margo Baptista, who worked as an administrative and executive assistant to the board and the president in the 80s and 90s, spoke about the sense of community, the feeling of being valued, knowing that people mattered. Folks really believed that they were contributing to changing the lives of students and making a difference in the city. Even if folks disagreed with one another or a decision, there was an underlying sense of respect and trust. Jill Day remembers Dr. Kelly saying, we are family, and we were. It was like a little city and we were one big family. It really was like that. Everybody was approachable. The president's office, all the VPs, the executives, people that were head of departments, they were all very accessible. So I'm wondering if in part what drives that sense of community, that sense of feeling that I discovered, sense of family that I discovered while doing the interviews, is that this is when we see the beginnings of the establishments of a lot of formal and informal events or activities. Jerry Kelly initiated the fall welcome in the early 80s, which was an annual event. So all staff was a social mixer. It was to inform college uh, staff about future plans and challenges. 
He said, I remember clearly that we always had barbecues. Everybody from administration to support staff faculty got involved in serving at the barbecues. It was a great way to get back in touch with the students, meet new students and so on. Another staff event that interviewees spoke of frequently were skit nights. So these were held in the spring and this was an opportunity uh, for all staff as Alan Blavitska, college assistant in 1985 said, to publicly criticize all aspects of the college. We were small enough then that he says that a lot of people knew each other from all different parts of the college, but also small enough that something like skit night where people came up with these skits lampooning various aspects of the college, that people got the joke because we were all aware of things. It was good team building. It really brought people together and gave them something beyond just work. Sharon Schnell thought it was very accepting on the part of the upper administration to allow staff and faculty to make, to take humor and to apply it to our everyday life. It didn't mean that we didn't take what we did seriously, but we could laugh at ourselves. And Margot Baptista remembers her first skit night at Millwood's campus. I felt conflicted in that I was laughing my head off, but I was a bit unsure about how administration would respond to the jabs that were being thrown at them. I found out later that then President Jerry Kelly gave the staff carte blanche to say and do whatever they wanted skit night, during skit night, and he would not hold anything against them. He was true to his word on this. Golfing, skiing, curling, there were lots of events for all staff. Um, and it, from what I can tell, staff at Grant McKinnon Community College were really big fans of golf. And so it starts out informal and then it gains steam when it becomes a fundraiser for the foundation. Bruce Vincent and Andy Pallas um, spoke of ski trips to Jasper in BC. They said we were a bit of ahead of our time in team building. Um, it just didn't end with administrative. All the academics went as well. Jerry Kelly thought the ski trips were fabulous. I often brought a guitar along on the bus trips for sing-alongs. I was awful on the guitar, but once your bus is rolling and the people are chatting and having fun, nobody cared much about the fact that I couldn't play the guitar. And so finally, the fifth theme that comes out of the interviews from the Oral History Project is one that I am loosely referring to as student appreciation in the sense that staff, both instructors and administration valued students and the students in turn valued the instructors. David Hannes, an instructor in the social work program from 1984 to 2010, said I wanted to be at a community college. I didn't want to be at some stuffy bureaucratic academic institution. That wasn't me. It wasn't where I was at. I wanted to be working alongside people and supporting them and their goals and empowering them. Sherry Ann Hoffmeyer, a nursing instructor, said that I think one of the things that really impressed me when I had the opportunity to meet Dr. McEwen and hear him speak about his values was the fact that we're servants and this idea that you need to be a servant to our learners, that we have an obligation to identify their learning needs and to help them find a way to address them. The alumni I interviewed were quick to name their favorite courses and instructors, which is impressive considering students were attending a two-year community college and trying to remember memories from 30, 40 years ago. So the terms used to describe instructors during this time were funny, enlightening, focused, creative, passionate, dynamic, positive, influential, big personalities. A commitment and appreciation of students extended to administrators. Jerry Kelly said all of his proudest achievements, achievements were related to student success stories. And Dr. McEwen also enjoyed interacting with students. Jerry Kelly said that McEwen um, particularly enjoyed chatting with students. He would walk along the hallway and would take him an hour or two to get from one end to the other because he was always talking to students. What Merrill Harris remembers most about Grant McEwen days is him. He was just the most phenomenally quiet man. He loved libraries and books. So if you were in that course, he would spend ages talking to you. In the later years, Dr. McEwen could no longer walk long distances. Trevor Beck described a special dolly that was designed for him with a chair and it had a seatbelt that was screwed into it. Dr. McEwen would sit backward and they would drive through the halls and he'd go, stop, stop, stop. And they'd pull the kids over and he'd start talking to these kids. And students adored Dr. McEwen. He had an impact on them. At the first celebration of McEwen Day on February 28, 1985, the McEwen journalist states that Dr. McEwen addressed the beefs about Cromdale 
specifically around the state of the classrooms, the crowded cafeteria, and other insufficiencies. Dr. McEwen's lecture that um, day in 1985 was to make reference to the pioneering spirit and to value what you have. According to the newspaper, it was a moving experience when Students Association President Teresa Azevedo presented Dr. McEwen with a college jacket. Other students reflecting on Dr. McEwen's speech that day said, I'm really glad that I was able to listen to Grant McEwen speak. For seeing and hearing Grant McEwen, the place was only a name to me. The name of our college has much more meaning to me now, and I feel proud to be attending. Grant McEwen said that if he were to accomplish something important in life, it would be to be a good steward. I wasn't sure of the exact meaning of this, so I looked it up in the dictionary. The steward is one who is actively concerned with the affairs of an organization. This doesn't mean to only be concerned with the affairs of what you're involved with, but to do something about it. And so I think it's only fitting to end this preservation, preservation presentation with an excerpt from Dr. McEwen's speech at the opening of the city center campus in 1993. This is what he said. It's only fair that those citizens whose imagination and vision brought the college to reality should be remembered with repeated congratulations to them and that those Albertans in public life who recognize the worth of the educational facility and supported its expansion with the necessary funding should be thanked and congratulated again. Thank you so much, Bella. That was that was amazing. Um, uh, a few few goosebumps for sure. So, if you have a question or a comment, just drop it in the chat. Um, I think my job is to repeat it for Bella so she can respond. And. Maybe before, uh, just while people are thinking, um, Vella, this is all available on a website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I remember, then I forgot, and then I remember, then I forgot that there is a website where all of these interviews are hosted. Yes, and I, yeah. So there is, and we can share that out. I mean, if you go, if you go to the McEwen Library website, services, archives, you'll see the oral history um, production. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for reminding me. <laughs> oh, I'm sneezing here. Sorry. Um, so awesome presentation. I have great memories. Um, do you have anything super interesting? Sorry, I have a question that was sent to me. Um, I'll just jump in here. Um, does the archives have any scripts or notes from those skit nights? We do not. Does, some, does somebody out there have them? <laughs> do they want to donate them? Is, is, that, is that where that's going? <laughs> I think someone was just interested. I'll read out this one. So um, interviews are really interesting to hear about. I'm curious about Grant McEwen's impassioned environmental speeches. Um, do you have any other details on those? So I don't. I mean, I know a lot of his stuff also comes out in the books, right? Like he's written close to 50 books. Um, we have a we have a copy of each in the library and the archives. So yeah, I I, I don't know more about that. I know there's a I know there's a group that's doing a bit of research that we're going to do that, dig into that for them. So that will probably be forthcoming. I guess I might also add that, that Dr. McEwen, I mean, his archives are scattered around the province, right? Um, so I have tried to, in our archives, acquire, you know, when, like McEwen Day stuff, you know, speeches that he might have given. Um, he had a full life before. You know, he, he, we were an institution named after him. So his stuff is at Lembo Provincial Archives. It, there's a lot of material out there. Also. And I have another question about whether you're still collecting stories. So it was always my intention for this to be an ongoing project. Like in a, in a world, I would have done 50 interviews the 50th anniversary. Um, so I guess. I, 
I would like to do more, but it would again require that whole application process through um, to get ethics approval. So it's a little bit trickier. But whoever is asking that question, if they're interested, I mean, they can certainly contact me. And if I get a few together, um, I could put together an application form. Okay, so Bella, this is really embarrassing since I'm the dean of the library. I'm on the library's website. What do I click to get to this project? Okay, so go to services along the top. Got okay, got it. And then you'll see archives at the bottom. Mm, yep, yep. Okay, scroll down, and you'll see a little blurb about us, and then the link to the actual site. Okay, scroll down. Access to records. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Val, I have a question here. Yeah. Um, when did the Cromdale and Assumption campuses close? Cromdale closes in 1993, and I'm just looking on the archives wall behind me because I have a picture of it. So Cromdale goes in 1993. Uh, was the other one Assumption? Was that the question? Assumption? 1981. Uh, um, I'm losing track. Did I ask this? Oh, so have you spoken to some of the other retirees? Um, I know some that participated and have some great memories. Are you okay? Still collecting stories. Yeah. Yes. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm obviously not very good at multitasking here. <laughs> Um, can I jump in with one here? Uh, these interviews are really interesting to hear about. Um, they're curious about Grant McEwen's impassioned um, environmental speeches. Could you offer mo more detail on those? I think you asked that one already. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. No, that was, yeah. Sorry, that was. I'm trying to paste the uh, URL into the chat and it won't work for me, but okay. Can I just say there should be only one platform for presenting all conferences and all of this, like, you know, let's just have one. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with world domination in that area. One ring to rule them all. Exactly. Any? Any other questions or comments? Um, so, Bella, and I know you've worked really, really hard on this project, but how how many years have you been working on this? <laughs> it feels like 15. Uh, I don't know. Um, so, we, probably from, you know, the idea of I want to do this to publishing the site in Omeka, I don't know, four or five years. And they weren't joking about the amount of time to, to transcribe records. Uh, I'm sure each interview I spent 30, 40 hours. Yeah, it's very time consuming. I, I finally managed to be able to paste the, the address of that uh, of the exhibit. It's, um, well, I mean, we have a long weekend coming up, but it's fascinating to, to actually listen to the stories. All right. Like so. Well, thanks everybody for coming out, especially the day before a long weekend. And um... yeah, no, and thank you, Val, for your time. Um, you know, if we're in person, I could like I'll hand hand you a box of chocolates or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Val, you you have an IOU from the uh, the Office of Research Services. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for kicking off our McEwen, our month of uh, celebration of scholarship at McEwen. And I think this was a wonderful way to start it off. Really, you know, uh, when President Trimby talks, you know, she always makes reference to people, place, or purpose. And I think um, you you quite nicely talk about all three of those things, you know, especially the place and, and the history on how we how we came to be. And I think it really gives us an appreciation for um, some of the values we want to make sure we don't lose going forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Lots of applause I was seeing. So thank you. Thank All you right. very much. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.